understand? And we are going to start with the Novationists today. We are going to talk about the, those people, the Novationists. Kind of interesting, the leader of the Novationists, Novation himself, or and some people call him Novatine, I think, or something like that. But we'll call him Novation. And uh, uh, he, the Novationist people, they, they were an interesting group of people. And... Uh, uh, we, we're gonna we're gonna have a lot of different resources, so bear with me here this week. They 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 really will be the Baptist heroes of the third of the third century, okay? Somebody just pulled that right off my desk. Uh, they will be the third hero, heroes though of the are the the heroes of the third century. These these men and women that fought for the faith in that time would have been would have been called novationists the donatists are going to come in shortly maybe next week we'll talk about the donatists if we do we may be on the donatists for a while i may split that up into a lot because the donatists we have a lot of information on okay uh the the novationists we don't have as much on the the the, the I, i'm going to give you a lot today but not as much as i'd like to because unfortunately a lot of their records were destroyed and you know there's just some some uh, speculation as to a few things concerning uh, Novation himself or Novatine himself, however you want to say his name. Um, but there, there's a little bit of, of of issue with him as far as as far as baptism goes. However, the people that followed it, which is interesting, because you have the same thing almost with Roger Williams as well, where some would consider Roger Williams not a real Baptist. Because the fact that unless he got baptized by Clark later, which he never said, I mean, really, uh, Roger Williams' baptism, would most Baptists would not even accept Roger Williams' baptism. Well, maybe today, but not historically speaking. They wouldn't have. Um, no, Nova, Novation, he, his baptism is really the same. Uh, he, it's, it's really not baptism at all in that sense. But we don't know because we don't have a, a thorough record of everything. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you this leader and why he came out and did what he did. But you have to understand the people that came after him or the, the, the leader, the, 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 he was the leader of that movement uh, of, of those Bible believers or those Baptist people, those Anabaptists they were called, because they rebaptized everybody that came to them. So they would have been like the first group that were really called rebaptizers or Anabaptists in that sense because that's what they did. They 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 did not call it they didn't consider themselves rebaptizers. 
Now, maybe one of you men can answer this for me. Why don't we consider ourselves rebaptizers? Luke. Exactly, because we don't we don't consider Roman Catholic baptism or Protestant baptism as biblical baptism anyway. So we just believe we baptize them once and we truly do baptize them where they say that they do, but they really don't. And it, they just got wet. That's right. That's all they got was wet. So anyway, we are going to come into the Novatius here and, and in the Collegiate Baptist History Workbook uh Novation, he before he professed conversion, this is by William Cathcart. William Cathcart is the famous Baptist historian that wrote these books right here. Um, these, let's see if I can get a hold of them. Actually, they're right up there, too. I have two sets of these. But this is the Baptist Encyclopedia. And this encyclopedia has... It's reprinted now by Baptist Standard Bearer. But th these two volumes, huge volumes, are biographies of Baptists in history. So he goes through all. William Cathcart was a great historian. He wrote a book on against Rome. It's called The Papacy. It's over here. Some, oh, here it is. The Papal System by Cathcart. This is a rare one. Um, anyway, but um, that's an original one. But. But uh, he wrote that. He was, a, he was a wonderful historian. So Brother Beller includes him in his book here in the Collegiate History Workbook. He says here, Novation, before he professed conversion, was a philosopher of remarkable ability, culture, eloquence, and powers of persuasion. persuasion. He was a natural leader of men. When attacked by a dangerous disease from which death was apprehended, in accordance with the opinion then commonly held by Christians, it was judged that he should be baptized to make heaven certain, and as his weakness rendered immersion impossible without risking his immediate death, he was subjected on his couch to a profuse application of water. In other words, they poured him. They did, what was that called? What did we call that? That's it, that's right. He was the first prominent man that rose to power that that actually that rose to authority i guess in the churches and that's it, that that received a clinical baptism now you have to understand something nowhere does it ever say that novation wanted that done to him but remember he was on his deathbed so they did that to him his friends and his family and others did that to him on his deathbed that they thought was his deathbed only god revived him and he didn't die so, uh, you know, I can't tell you that I can tell you what the procedure was and we'll read about it. A lot of times these men, after they had that clinical baptism like that, which we understand to be no baptism at all. Many times if they lived, they had to go to the bishop and they had to be scripturally baptized. So because they lived and they weren't sick and on their deathbed and they could be baptized then scripturally. Whatever. What, is, what it shows us, it, we'll talk about later about that a little bit, okay? Um, we are not informed that Novation desired this ceremony himself without any persuasions from his alarmed friends. The writer wa was once sent to, a, to see a dying lady, this is Cathcart talking, and after praying with her, was earnestly pressed by a follower of Irish Romanism, the perverted faith of St. Patrick the Baptist, to regenerate her, like to baptismal regeneration. He declined to exercise the powers of the Spirit of God and the functions of the pedo-baptist minister. Had he yielded, the lady was in a condition in which she could not be held responsible for the act. What he's saying is like Novation, he couldn't, he didn't know what they were doing to him. I mean, he was like out of it. They thought he was dead. And it is not improbable that this was the situation with Novation. He was spared by the providence of God for a mighty work in the churches. And when restored to health, he became a very, very active in advancing the interests of Christianity in Rome. At that period, the church in the capital of the world, as Eusebius records, had 46 presbyters, 14 deacons and subdeacons, 50 minor ecclesiastical officials, and widows and sick and indigent, indigent persons, numbering in all 1,500 whose support had to be provided for. So you're going to listen here. They got into some situational ethics and some things that in order to compromise, in order to make things work right in their eyes. And partly to assist in bearing this burden, but chiefly through a lack of faith and of complete consecration to God, the door of the church was kept very wide for the admission of unconverted professors. So what, what happened? 
They had a need. They had bills to pay. They had things that were going on, and what did they do? The churches were starting to compromise. Does that sound familiar? Right? It happens today, doesn't it? It happens today. Happened back then. Right? So what happened was a war, really, in the churches that started. And when these, per- when these persons betrayed the Savior by sacrificing the idols in times of persecution, their conduct was excused by their lax brethren, and the excommunication necessarily pronounced upon them immediately after their apostasy was speedily removed. Okay, so here's what happened. And we're gonna, I'm going to explain this over and over again, and it's going to be a little bit repetitive. But you know what? I find that we need things to be repetitive, so it kind of catches on because we let them slip, don't we, or we don't remember them. So I'm going to read a few different authors to show you, actually five or six, to show you that there was a consensus of what happened. Okay, so it wasn't just one person that said this. Okay, here's what was happening in the churches. The, Nova- uh, the, the rise of the novation has happened, and I, I suspect the Donatists at the same time. The rise of those people happened because the churches were admitting into their, into their company mere professors of faith. And they would come in, but they, they didn't walk with God. And guess what happened? Persecution. And when persecution happened, what happened to the, the, the people that weren't serious about the Lord? They turned their brothers and sisters in. They, they turned on them. They betrayed them. They, 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 they blasphemed God's name, and they became apostates. Well, then after some of that was over, then what happened was the churches, because of the lax area that their brethren had, they would re-administer those people back into the churches. They'd say, oh, we're sorry we did that. Can we come back without any type of uh, oversight, without any type of watching and, and, and any type of observance of whether they were serious in the faith? So what happened is it weakened the churches. Well... If you had a zeal for God and you loved the Lord and you loved the truth and you were a man like no, no, Novation, if you were a man like him, then Novation rises up and says, wait a minute. You can't be doing that. You, you can't be admitting these people back in. They blasphemed God. They said they were apostates. They renounced the name of Christ. We're not going to let them back in that easy. The churches are weak. They're full of dead men's bones. They're wicked. They said, we can't do that. Nobody said, we can't do that. Well, what's going to happen then? Well, they're going to do what Baptists usually do. Either you work it out or you split. That's what Baptists do. They split. Baptist history, if you studied all the way down through the centuries, they split. Just like a banana. They split. It happens. Why? Because if a man rises up that wants to, that, that, that is, or it could be a wrong person. It could be wrong even. But, but many times it was, a, it was an issue of revival, really, that happened because a man would rise up and say, I'm tired of this dead apostasy. I'm tired of seeing the church is so weak. I can't go to church there on Sunday. I can't show up there. It's dead. They don't believe the Bible. They're not following the scriptures. I'm not going there. Well, in comes a man named Novation that has a problem with that. He, he has a real problem with it. Cornelius was a Roman presbyter with an eager eye to the support to be gathered from restored apostates. So what happened to Cornelius? Well, Cornelius, he was a man that decided that, and by the way, just so you're not confused, this is not the Cornelius from 300 years before that, okay? This is not a Bible man. This is a man in the third century. Uh, but I just want to, because some of you might make that connection, be like, Cornelius? Man, that guy lived a long time. So I just, I want to make sure we're all on the same page, all right? But, uh, but Cornelius was a presbyter at the time, and he arose, and he saw a financial reason to readmit these apostates into the church. Why? Well, they had 1,500 people to take care of. They had widows and those that were poor and those that needed uh, needed food and, and, and they needed provided for and all those things. So he said, well, there's all these apostates out here. Let's, they, they want readmittance into the church because there became a time of peace. There came a time of about 40 to 50 years of peace in the churches where they weren't being slaughtered. They stopped killing them. That's always a dangerous time. America has lived uh, 
mostly in a 200 years of peace in the churches in that sense, where we haven't been slaughtered and killed. And what has it done? What do we have? Weak churches. We have apostasy. We have apostates in the pulpit. We have churches that are full of apostasy. We have long-haired hippies in choirs. We've got people not living for Lord, the Lord. We've got whores in the church. We've got all these things going on now. Why is that? Because of the lax. Because of peace. Ah, brother, you, you have to always remember, when you ought to be more on your guard than any time is when you're in prosperity. Oh, goodness. Always be on your guard in prosperity. Always, 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 always be on your guard. During any time of prosperity, because times of prosperity are times of falling, times of temptation. Always be on your guard when it comes to prosperity. Amen. So that's what happened here. So Cornelius, he, he saw that and he, he saw the support that would be gathered from restored apostates. He strongly advocated their forgiveness by the church. But Novation very strenuously resisted it. And when a successor to Bishop Fabian was to be elected, Cornelius was properly made a predecessor of a long line of coming popes later on that would come. Who loved gold more than anything in the Christian religion. After Cornelius became bishop, Novation was elevated to the same office by three Italian bishops and at once funded founded, excuse me, the, the pure community for whose advancement he labored with great success until martyrdom removed him from the presence of wicked church members in full ecclesiastical standing. See, Novation, he decided, no, the church needs to be pure. God says the church is to be pure. They're to have a discipline. They're to have order. They're, they're to have holiness and separation and righteousness. The church is a called out assembly. And we can't have all this going on here. Right? Among the charges brought by Cornelius against Novation, a list of which can be found in Eusebius, was an accusation of cowardice for refusing to perform the duties of his ministerial office in a time of persecution. Novation set up a new community in defiance of Cornelius and of, of nearly all the Christian bishops on earth, and in this he showed unusual courage. Opposition to the treachery charged upon himself by Cornelius was the chief instrument which he used to establish his pure church. And it is not in human nature to believe that any man could found a new community in Rome itself by denunciations of a cowardly crime of which he himself had given a conspicuous example. Besides, he left the world as a martyr. So how could he have been a coward? He wasn't a coward. And what he did was he was labeled that because he left them and he said you know what you guys have left the faith and we're not going to do that so we're going to start we're going to start our own churches and they're going to be independent from rome's stiff-handed presbytery that was growing it was growing in power rome was becoming the seat of apostasy and it was coming very closely this was on the heels of constantine it was getting to the point before Constantine would rise to the throne and then forever the church and state would be merged together in what is known as the Roman Catholic papacy and is still there today. So in the meantime, you have origin around. You have men like Novation. You have th those men around who were prominent men. So one of the questions that you'll have for this next week is who was the prominent biblical figure that fought against the Roman apostasy. And what was his, what was his chief complaint with those churches? And his chief complaint was that they were not pure, that they had apostatized, that they had led apostates into the church. So his problem with them was that the churches were no longer pure. That they were that they were they were fouling themselves, that they were that they were hurting themselves. It was customary in the time of Ambrose when the minister distributed the Lord's Supper to the faithful to say the body of Christ and the recipient answered Amen. Cornelius in the same 
Columbus letter in Eusebius states that Novation, when he ca- gave a portion of the Eucharist to a communicant, insisted instead of permitting him to say amen according to the usage, no doubt then in ex- existence, seized his hand in both of his hands before he partook of the symbolic bread and made him swear by the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that he would never desert him nor turn to Cornelius. But that was a charge they made against him. I'm telling you, I, and I, but it wasn't true. Uh, but I can tell you that I'm not surprised. There will all, there are always charges against God's people. There are always char- against men who stand up for the faith. They're always going to be charged with something. And most of the time, many times, it's a lie. Cathcart goes on to say, this story carries its own refutation. The idea that the founder of the purest Christian community then in existence should resort to such an infamous procedure is simply incredible. Cornelius, in the same connection, makes slanderous statements about the extraordinary ambition of Novation, which have come down to us through the ecclesiastical history of Eusebius, and his vanity is frequently given as the motive that led to his assumption of the bishop's office and to the Reformation inaugurated by Novation. The Novations called themselves Catharii, or Puritans. The cornerstone of the denomination was purity of church membership. Novation charged Cornelius and his followers with with dishonoring the church of God and destroying the divine character by admitting apostates into its membership. Man, they were strict. Novation was strict, very strict. He maintained that those who had sacrificed to the idols to save their lives should never be permitted to come to the Lord's table again. Now, I know that's pretty harsh, but you got to understand that people were dying. That was a dangerous time to admit apostates back into the churches when... These people would could die. I mean, these people could be killed by people that said they were brothers, apostate, curse God, and then won admittance back into the church. See, so Novation, he wasn't having it. He's like, no, not here. You're not doing that here. Novation charged... Cornelius and his followers with dishonoring the church of God, destroying its divine character by admitting apostates. He maintained that those who had sacrificed to those idols, they should be gone, right? Never again. This theory became popular with the saintly heroes and heroines who suffered terribly at the hands of Christ's persecuting enemies, but whose lives were spared. And all true Christians felt a strong leaning towards the holy religion advocated and exhibited by Novation and his followers. See, those that followed Christ said, you know what? I mean, these are times of suffering, and we're willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. So they said, we're not going to, we're, Rome can keep their churches. They can keep their presbyteries, they can keep their people, but we're not going to be a part of them. They keep their apostates. You can have, basically what they said is Rome can have, Cornelius can have his apostates. We don't want them. You keep them. The general doctrines of the Novationists, the Novations were in perfect harmony with those received by the church universal. They only dif- differed from it on questions of discipline and chiefly on the great subject of consecration to God. So what he meant was the standard doctrines in the churches of the day, they still held to them. They, they, there, wasn't, there wasn't this departure with uh, infant baptism or anything like that. It was coming. It was starting to, um, starting to come, but it, it hadn't been there yet. Novation himself was a man of fervent piety. They, oh, by the way, let me back up. They only differed from it on questions of discipline, chiefly on the great subject of consecration to God. So what was that? It means that they, Novation, they, they expected their people to live for God. They expected that if you named the name of Christ and you were a member of that, of that church, that you would live for God. You know, that used to be kind of a normal thing among Baptists. It isn't today, but it ought to be that you would live for God. Like I already, I mean, honestly, I know that we all need support, edification. We need strengthen. We need preaching. uh, We need uh, the power of the Holy Ghost. But I honestly, when I wake up every morning, I expect you, I expect you and I both, I expect us to live for God. I absolutely do. 
I don't expect that you go off into the world and live like the world. I don't expect that you live a different way than you do. Then you present yourself in the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. I expect that you to live a consistent, holy life in Jesus Christ. And I would hope you expect the same for me. Amen. But they, they had a problem with, with the, the issues of con- consecration and discipline. Like they, the churches didn't have any discipline, and they had a problem with the order and the, and the lack of discipline in the churches. Sound familiar? If you go to the average church today and you talk about church discipline, they'll look at you and be like, what's that? Right, like, like what, what's that? Yeah, it's kind of funny. I was reading some old emails uh, briefly. I read one. Not, I read one portion of one of of someone who uh, slandered me the same way Cornelius slandered uh, Novation. And it was interesting to me uh, when, in reading that, that this person referenced basically church discipline like it was like it was like a cult, basically. And that's unfortunate, really, to be honest with you, because, see, it's biblical. But you don't think people told the novationists, you're just a cult. You guys are just a cult. That's that's all you are. Big deal. Say what you want. I don't care. What does it matter? What does it matter? They don't have the guts to prove it wrong from the scriptures because they can't. And if they could, they would. So all they have is a lying tongue to use. Because that's all they can do. That's, that's all that they are able to do is lie. They can't tell the truth, so they have to lie. Right, and they don't want to get right with God. So then you're just a cult. That's how it works. And Anna Boo Boo, you big cult. Right? That's how, that, that's how, right? I mean, it's like child's play. They, they did the same thing to the innovation. I love studying Baptist history. You know why? Because you find out, well, you know what? I'm not the only one. We're not the only ones. Hey, this isn't new. This has been going on since the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ in the New Testament. They stoned the prophets before them. But we start to look, wait, this isn't new. Right, it hasn't changed. Novation himself was a man of fervent piety, and his life after his conversion was above reproach. Unless when accusations came from a calamiter, whose charges were incapable of proof. Yeah, proof for it? No. He was author of works on the Passover, circumcision, the Sabbath, high priest, and the Trinity. I want to read those. And I think they're in those Nisan fathers or anti-Nisan or one of those. But I want to get those, those works and read some of those that were translated. Anyway, he had many distinguished men among his disciples. His community spread very widely and enjoyed special prosperity in Fergia, but declined rapidly in the 5th century. The Novatians as a people were an honor to Christianity, and their teachings and example exercised a powerful restraint upon the growing corruptions of the old church. The Novatians commenced their denominational life when the baptism of an unconscious babe was unknown outside of Africa, and there it had had a limited, if not a doubtful, existence. These considerations together with the holiness of life demanded by Novation churches have led many persons to regard them as Baptists. Of the truth of this opinion in the early history of this people, there can be no doubt. And what the majority of their churches baptized only instructed persons. So their history is there. Now, Novation himself, uh, we don't know the entire story of that. We never will know. But the point is that those that came after him And those that followed, followed a strict order and discipline. So the people in Ovatius, after the bitter persecutions of the second century, the churches had some rest. The Christians enjoyed peace from their enemies for about 40 years. However, in 249, the emperor Decius required all Roman citizens to conform to pagan worship. Because of the soft and lax attitude of believers, large numbers denied the Lord during this persecution. They were called the traitors. 
After the Decius persecution, some of the traditors wanted back into the churches. And you may imagine, after watching loved ones and pastors brutally murdered at the hands of pagan Rome, some of the faithful church members would be hesitant to welcome those traitors into regular fellowship with the persecuted church. Does that sound, sound normal? So in comes the rise of novation, right? Because all these family members are like, look, I mean, you turned my uncle in and they murdered him. I mean... My children died because of you, and you went back in. How do we know you're real? Like, how do we know you're really sorry, and now you're sorry because the persecution's over? You weren't sorry after you did it? What'd they do? They discerned. They looked at it, they discerned, and they were like, you know. Now, were they too strict? You know, what I'll leave it to is history for that because I wasn't there. I wasn't there, but I know something. There's a good chance that there's a few people that have left this church that probably wouldn't come back. Probably wouldn't be able to. Probably wouldn't. Does that mean we don't forgive them? No, absolutely. That doesn't mean we don't forgive them. That doesn't mean that at all. It means that the Lord may not lead us to do that. We as a church would pray about that. We would come together as a church and as men, and we would come together. Right? Right? And we would have to make that decision. We'd have to pray about that. But there could be. I can see that. Men that have caused grave and, and, and terrible uh, issues and problems in the church and things like that. I could see where a church would say, you know, I think we forgive you, but, but we, we believe that it would be best if you became, and we free you from anything between us and everything like that. And we, we extend you a hand of fellow, but we believe you should go somewhere else and go to church. There's nothing wrong with that. Churches have the right to do that. And that's not, that's not wrong. They have the right to make those decisions, you know, and, and they can make those decisions. And they need to be made very carefully. But I can understand this because I know what damage <laughs> one man can cause. <laughs> I know it full well. So I understand why they, plus this was a life and death issue with these people here. What transpired was pivotal. The, trader, the traitors had been given letters of mercy from those that suffered during the persecution, beseeching the church to allow them to reenter. This was the beginning of prayers to the saints. That's how those prayers, that's how they began to, to, uh, to make prayers to the saints. That's how that heresy developed, was through that right there. From 200 to 250, the purity of the local church had begun to erode. The bishopric degenerated into central governments headed by new, more powerful bishops. These bishops did not rule in one local church. They ruled several and appointed priests to care for the local assemblies. This was not a universal structure, but it was popular in the largest of the Asian and European cities. As some of the traditors attempted to reenter the local churches, a great controversy occur occurred at the most powerful of all metropolitan churches, the church at Rome. There's where it started to get uh, a, a control. The church at Rome had just lost its pastor, and in the process of securing a new bishop, a young preacher named Novation voiced his concerns about the admission of tra traitors back into the fellowship. By now, a Roman synod, not found in the Bible, had evolved and began their self-appointed process of locating a new pastor for the church. The Synod decided upon Cornelius to be the next bishop of Rome. Novation opposed the appointment. Novation was so convinced that his cause was correct that he began to separate, uh, he began a separate church apart from the authority of the Roman Synod. Orchard, which we're going to read from here in a few minutes, Orchard said this. We'll read part of what he said here. The flagrancy of some apostates occasioned an opposition to their readmission. In the time of peace, many had entered the church without calculating on trials. And when persecution arose, such persons revolted easily to idolatry. And on trials subsiding, gained but too easy admittance, admittance again to communion. One novation of presbyter in the Church of Rome strongly opposed the readmission of apostates, but he was not successful. The choice of a pastor in the same church fell upon Cornelius, whose election novation opposed from his readiness to readmit apostates. Novation consequently separated himself from the church and from Cornelius's jurisdiction. Evil and good came out of this battle. The evil included the arrogance of the new Roman synod called the Holy See. Right? 
which ruled that the new breakaway church did not have right to exist. As a byproduct of the public repentance of the traitors, confession began to be practiced by preachers and priests who heard penitent speeches and judged whether they were adequate. So what happened? That started public confession. That started those public confessions that, that they did with the priest. The good thing that came from the break was the display of courage on the part of those who separated from tyranny to follow God's leading into independency. A council of 60 bishops called by Cornelius excommunicated Novation in 251. However, a large number of bishops disgusted at the growing control of Rome and her see withdrew to form their own independent congregations. Novation became the first bishop or pastor of the new Novationist Church at Rome. Those people collectively became known as the Novationists, and their independent churches existed well into the 5th century. So, you know, who was, who, was the, the, um, who was the leader of the Novationists? You know, that's, that's the question that we asked. And what was his main problem with the Bishop of Rome? And who was that Bishop of Rome? That's another good question. What was his name? The Bishop of Rome. What was his name? And his name was Cornelius. That was his name, okay? So, all right. Now, we're going to keep going here. And uh, we're going to look at what Orchard has to say. And there's a few others that, that we want to look at uh, that they had some issues. Let me see here. Give me a second. Find my spot here. There we go. By the way, Orchards is a good book to get to. It's not very expensive. And it's a Orchards history is a good history. Okay, so we're going to start with the Nova Nova Novatine or Novation descent that took place. When Decius came to the throne in 249, he required by edicts all persons in the empire to conform to that pagan worship. Forty years' toleration had greatly increased professors, and they were found in every department of the government. They had been so long unaccustomed to trials that the lives of many were unsuited to suffering. Decius' edicts rent asunder the churches. Multitudes apostatized, and many were martyred. In two years, the trial abated. When many apostates applied for res restoration to Christian fellowship and sanctioned their application by letters written by some eminent Christians who had been martyrs during the persecution. The flagrancy of some apostates occasioned an opposition to their readmission. In the time of peace, many had entered the church without calculating on those trials. We talked about that. One novation of presbyter in, in the Church of Rome, he strongly opposed that. We talked about that as well. Uh, novation with every considerate person was disgusted with the hasty admission of such apostates. He, he was upset about it, to communion, and with the conduct of many pastors who were more concerned about numbers than purity of communion. Sound familiar? Bodies, bucks, and buildings, that's right. They were more concerned with numbers than purity of communion. So Novation, it, he, he had a problem with that. He didn't like it because God didn't like it. He knew it was unscriptural. He, he knew that, that it was a problem. Novation was the first to begin to separate interests with, the, with success, and which was known for centuries by his name. One Novatus of Car Carthage coming to Rome united himself with Novation, and their combined efforts were attended with remarkable success. It is evident that many persons were previously in such a situation as to embrace the earliest opportunity of uniting with churches whose communion was scriptural. Nova Novation became the first pastor in the new interest and is accused of the crime of giving birth to an innumerable multitude of congregations of Puritans in every part of the Roman Empire, and yet all the influence he exercised was an upright example in moral persuasion. These churches flourished in the 5th century. So what happened? Novation, he didn't, he didn't force anybody by the state or by the hand of Rome or by uh, upon death or upon anything else, but he persuaded them by his godly example. He led them in a way that they would make their churches independent and would not be subject to Rome. That's what he did. And for that, many people hated him. 
He used persuasion. He did not use persecution. See the difference? He would rightly be called a Puritan in that sense and not the Puritans from New England that used persecution. Isn't that right? See the difference? He didn't use persecution. He used persuasion. Amen. Think about that. That's important. What's that? No, the autonomy of the local church was a, is a Baptist principle. It's a Bible principle, and it's a Baptist one. There was no difference in point of doctrine between the Novatius and other Christians. No, Novatian had seen evil results from the readmitting of apostates. He saw what happened, and he was like, they shouldn't be back here. The churches were becoming so weak. He consequently refused communion to all those who had fallen after baptism. Now, he's not talking about all those that sinned. The terms of admission in those churches were, if you wish to join any of our churches, you may be admitted among us by baptism. But observe that if you fall away into idolatry or vice, we shall separate you from our communion, and on no account can you be readmitted with us. Now, he was a little harsh with that. <laughs> but, um, but listen to what he said, though. This is important because I've had people say the same thing. You know, if, if, they're, if they're disciplined out or something like that, they act like, we're big, mean people and everything else. But listen to what he said. We shall never attempt to injure you. We won't hurt you. We shall never attempt to injure you in your person, property, or character. So they didn't go a character assassinating those people. Right? They didn't do that. What'd they do? They said, well, we'll just let them go. They're going to go, but they're not allowed here again. Well, that's what we did. That's what most churches do. Well, did. We shall never attempt to injure you, you in your person or your property or your character. We do not presume to judge the sincerity of your repentance. Right? They said, you may be repentant. That may be true. But they were just like, but you can't come back here. You got to go somewhere else. <laughs> right? Or your future state. We're not saying you're lost. But you can never be readmitted re to the fellowship of our churches without our giving up the securest guardian we have for the purity of our communion. I mean, they were serious. Now, whether you agree of it to the level that Novation did, I will say this. Churches need just a little bit more of this. And people would take seriously membership in a local New Testament church. And their walk with God. They considered, says Moshim, the Christian church as a society where virtue and innocence reigned universally, and none of whose members from their entrance into it had defiled themselves with any enormous crimes, and of consequence, they looked upon every society which readmitted heinous offenders to its communion as unworthy of the title of the true Christian church. They were pretty strict. On account of the church's severity of discipline, the example was followed by many. Listen to what happened, though. Oh, then nobody wanted to go to their churches, and it was terrible. No. And churches of this order flourished in the greatest part of those provinces which had received the gospel. Why? Because they had discipline, they had order, and they took it serious, and their members took it serious. It's a serious thing to be a member of the local New Testament church. And I'll remind you, uh, the night before Thanksgiving, that Wednesday night, we will be observing the Lord's table here at Old Pass Baptist Church for members that are members of Old Pass Baptist Church. We'll be observing the Lord's table. Remember that. Amen. But listen, the importance of that is that they, they, they believe there is an importance at their communion table, that when they, they sat at table, the table with men, when they sat there, that it was serious. That, that, that we take this serious. 
Somebody asked me, uh, like, on the street, if your son does this, and God forbid that he would, and if he does that or your daughter or anybody else, what are you going to do? I got to keep serving God. I believe what that book says. I can't turn my back on that. Right? If I've showed him the God of the Bible, if I've showed my children the God of the Bible, and they turn their back on the God of the Bible, woe unto them. Amen. But what are we going to do? The same thing we've always done by God's grace. We're going to get up and we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to live our lives for God and we're going to die for God if need be. But we will live and we will die in Christ and that's what we'll do. That's what we have to do. Hey, whatever you think about Japheth, at least he said, I've opened my mouth unto the Lord and I cannot go back. Right? Foolish as it was the way in which he opened his mouth. But he said, I decided, I, I, I've opened up my mouth unto the Lord. I cannot go back. Isn't that the way it should be, brother? But isn't that a picture of a lot of things, though? There's so many pictures there in that. Isn't that a picture? Well, what, if, what if my son or my daughter or, or, or my wife or anybody else, what if they turn their back on the Lord? What do we do? We follow the Lord. <laughs> That's what we do. That's what we do. Why? Because we've opened our mouth unto the Lord. We cannot go back. How can we? Where would we go? He has the words of life. Where can we go? Where, to whom do we go? Death is everywhere else. There is no turning back, no turning back. Right? The world behind me, the cross before me. Amen. So these churches flourished in that time. Why? Because they stood for something. That's why. They stood for the Bible, and God blesses his word. Many advenient rites had been appointed and interwoven with baptism with a threefold ad administration of the ordinance in the old interest, which obscured the original simplicity and design of the institute. Institutor. To remove all human appendages, the novatius said to the candidates, if you be a virtuous believer and will accede to our confederacy against sin, you may be admitted among us by baptism, or if any Catholic has baptized you before, by rebaptism. And they must be brighters. No, they're just biblical. They just said, hey. If, I mean, we're not going to accept that Catholic stuff. Hey, by the way, did you, Catholics won't accept yours either. But I wouldn't care if they did. I wouldn't want anything to do with theirs. Right? And another thing, I don't accept Pentecostal baptism or them other nuts and kooks that are out there. Because it's a spirit. And you either submit to the Lord Jesus Christ and you submit to this church or you don't. But you ain't going to skate in here with some Pentecostal baptism or some Protestant baptism like that. And nope. The Lord said that we speak the, all speak the same thing. We have one mind. That's right. <laughs> He's speaking in tongues back there. I hear him. Angelic, that's right. He has angelic tongues, that's right. I like what he said, though. If you be a virtuous believer and will accede to our confederacy against sin, you may be admitted among us by baptism. They were at later periods called Anabaptists. The church th churches thus formed upon a plan of strict communion and rigid discipline obtained the reproach of Puritans. They were the oldest body of Christian churches of which we have an account, any account and a secession of them. We shall prove has continued to the present day. Novation's example had a powerful influence and Puritan churches rose in different parts in quick succession. Why? Truth. So early as 254, these dissenters are complained of as having infected France with their doctrines. What's that? Oh, uh, let's see. Let me back up. Let me see. Let me back up. The churches thus formed upon a plan of strict communion and rigid discipline obtained the reproach of Puritans. They were the oldest body of Christian churches of which we may have any, have any account at a secession of them. 
We shall prove his continued to the present day. Novation's example had a powerful influence, and Puritan churches rose in different parts in quick succession. So early as these dissenters are complained of as having infected France with their doctrines, which was, so basically the French and the people, they, they, they said that they had infected them, which will aid us in the Albigensians. Churches where the, with, where the same severity of discipline is traced and reprobated. Yeah, that's right. You didn't like the French. That's right, Paul. I remember that. But, um, but you see, what are they known for? They're always talking about, when you trace these Baptists, they're always talking about their, their baptism and their discipline, their order in the churches, that, that, that they kept their polity, their practice. Why? Because their doctrine dictated their practice. Amen. So they didn't like them. Learned men and historians have investigated the pretensions of these churches to puritanical character and have conferred on them the palm of honor. Dupin says, Novation's style is pure, clean, and polite. His expressions choice, his thoughts natural, and his way of reasoning just. He is full of citations of texts of Scripture that are always to the purpose, and besides, there is a great deal of order and method in those treaties of this we now have, and he never speaks but with a, word of mo a world of moderation and candor. Their manners, says Dr. Adam Clark, were in general simple and holy. Indeed, their rigid discipline is no mean proof of this. Well, we well know that those called pietists in Germany and Puritans in England were in general in their respective times among the most religious and holy people in both nations. So these people were, and by the way, turn to uh, Psalm 12. Psalm 12. These are going to be your verses this week, children. Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver, tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So these are going to be your memorization verses this week. And you can see how these men, they, they, God preserved his word. By the way, did you know that God preserved his word and he used imperfect people? I can't tell you that I agree with the way Novation did the clinical baptism thing, and I don't know, and, and I don't believe it's baptism and all that. You, you know where we stand on that. But listen, where men depart from the Scriptures, we don't follow them, right? But everybody was immersed, and, and immersion was, was, was the mode of baptism of the Novationists and, and of Rome at the time, even Rome immersed. It was where pouring was starting to come into play, though. It was starting to have an effect. But these churches, they held to proper baptism. In fact, they held to a trine immersion. That's what they held to. Which, and, and I say that only because I, I realize that baptizing in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost is the Trinity, and I don't have to do a trine immersion for that, right? But the point is, is that they held to that. Everyone else and, and their followers held to that baptism from everything that we know. Right. They held to that because there was no infant baptism. The main thrust that you have to understand is what novation in those men. Uh, infant baptism was going to start on was starting on the rise. It was starting to like come, I think, at this point. It was going to come in about. Three hundred or so around that time, it was starting to become popular, not popular, but starting to rise. And and they, you know, the and baptismal regeneration was already in play there. So. It doesn't take men that long to apostatize. It really doesn't. Okay, so let's see. Where was I? Okay, these churches ex existed for 60 years under a pagan government, during which time the old corrupt interests at Rome, Carthage, and other places possessed no means but those of persuasion and reproach to stay the progress of dissent. During this period, the Novation churches were very prosperous and were planted all over the Roman Empire. They were very numerous, says Lardner, in Fergia, and a number of eminent men were raised up in the work of the ministry. It is impossible to calculate the benefit of their services to mankind. Their influence must have considerably checked the spirit of innovation and secularity in the old churches. Although rigid in discipline and schismatic in character, yet they were found extensive and in a flourishing condition. When Constantine is going to come on the scene, but we'll stop 
in that book right there. Um, let me see. I might have a few other pages. Let me see. In this one. I do have a few more references. Bear with me here. Um, it's good history. And we'll finish with the novations because there's really not a ton on them that, that we'll have. But it, it's good for us to go over this. And uh, I believe you'll learn some things. Amen. Let's see. Uh, we don't need to cover that. That's okay. We'll cover that later. Only cover the Donatists. Because the Novatius and the Donatists are gonna they're gonna overlap each other. They're gonna be around the same time. Okay, so these Puritans and the Novatius were exceedingly numerous in Fergia. These dissenters baptized all that joined their assemblies by immersion in the name of the Trinity on a personal profession of faith. And if they had been baptized before, they re-baptized them. So in other words, they didn't count their baptism. So that's why they did that. Um, that was a note, another note from Orchard there about that time period. Now, you'll have, you have to understand that men arose back then. Uh, men would arise and would lead the charge and plant a ton of churches. I'll give you a modern day, not modern day, but an example in America of that would have been Shubal Stearns. A man like Shubal Stearns arose, but there was already the popularity of the Baptist name, and that's and they were Anabaptists or Baptists, and they used the Baptist name, and, and that's what they did. So those Baptist men, they planted hundreds of churches, which turned into thousands of churches, Right? So you would see the same thing over in Europe and over in those areas, over there in Rome and all those areas. You would see areas, that, and that's why you're going to see the valleys of Piedmont were full of Waldensian churches when we get to that point. Or the Donatists in Africa, there were Donatist churches everywhere. Because a man would rise up, do something for God, break out of the norm of apostasy that was there, and his light would shine so bright and God would use him greatly. That's what would happen. So... That, that is what happened to them, and uh, which, anyway, so th that's why you see these pockets of revival. Okay, you'll see them. All right, let me get this here. There we go. This thing's handy, Joshua, that little arm on there. I like that. Man, that's good. I like that. Stick your finger in there, Andrew. I'm going to. Smack your finger in that thing. That's right. About A.D. 281, the Novatius arose. They differed with the Montanists concerning the Spirit's inspiration, while they held much in common. They were charged by the Catholics rather with schism than heresy, as a rigid discipline separated them, not doctrine. The case of Novation is the first recorded instance of departure from immersion and baptism, and the first instance of clinic baptism, that is, baptism of those who were believed to be dying. When a catechumen... he when a catechumen, he was supposed to lie at the point of death and ask baptism in order to save his soul, but could not be three times immersed as was the practice. Yet something must be done, and, and that in a hurry, so while stretched on his bed, water was poured all around his person in an outline enclosing his whole body. Then it was poured all over him till he was drenched, making perfusion as near as an immersion as possible. If he died, this was to stand for baptism, saving him by a narrow escape. But if he lived, his baptism was to be considered defective, right? Now, we understand it wasn't baptism, and they didn't need it anyway uh, to be saved. But, you know, I, you can't overlook history. You know, you can't overlook history and not tell the truth about it. I got to tell you the truth about what some of these men believed and, and, you know, and where they were wrong, because we've got to be honest. By the way, God used imperfect people to preserve his word and to preserve his churches. These men, all the way through the centuries, they weren't perfect on doctrine. And guess what? We're going to find out someday we aren't either. I guarantee you there's going to be something someday. Now, if we thought we were wrong right now, we'd get it right, wouldn't we? Right? We would, for sure. So that's just, that's the truth of the matter. All right. Yet something must be done so that in a hurry they did that. Okay, let me, let me move on from that. If he died, this was to stand. Cornelius, the bishop of Rome at that time, was an obstinate immersionist. Good for him. And uh, wrote to Fabians, the bishop of Antioch, concerning Nova Novation. Thus, relieved by exorcist, he fell into an obstinate disease. And being supposed about to die, he having been poured around on the bed where, where he lay, received saving grace, if indeed it 
be proper to say it, he says, Eusebius does not express the object of the verb. Thus, if indeed it is proper to say that one like him did receive baptism. So he didn't even believe that it was really baptism. Vale states that clinics who recovered were required by the rule to go to the bishop to supply what was wanting in that baptism. But failing to do this, no Novation insisted on entering the ministry, which persistence shook the nerves of Cornelius beyond endurance. Yet at Novation was a remarkably talented man. He was, a, he was made a presbyter without trying immersion. Cave excuses this in the kindest manner, calling novation a less solemn and perfect kind of baptism, partly because it was done not by immersion. Persons, persons are supposed at such a time to desire it chiefly out of fear of death, and many times were not thoroughly masters of their own understanding. So what they're saying is they did this to him, and he probably didn't even realize it, that they were doing it, because he wasn't even in his mind. For which reasons persons so baptized, if they recovered, are by the fathers of the neo Caesarean council rendered ordinarily incapable of being admitted to the degrees of presbyters in the church. They reckoned that no man could be saved without being baptized and cared not much in cases of necessity. So they had it how they came by it. His reference in the canon, which decrees that no person is baptized in time of sickness should be ordained a presbyter because his faith was not voluntary. Well, duh, then he wouldn't be baptized scripturally anyway. Kind of a weird way these people looked at things sometimes. Cornelius would not let them pass muster, even if they were masters of their understanding. But Chrysostom was a more notional immersionist still and gave his reasons at length of doubting the salvation of such men at all. <laughs> Chrysostom, he was like, well, I don't think they're even saved if they don't want to be baptized scripturally, so there's something wrong with those people. Because if you're saved, you ought to want to be baptized. That's what. That's how... I'm with him. I agree with him. That's, 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 you know, why wouldn't you want to be? Amen. And gave his reasons at length for doubting it. In general, the fathers sneered at these sickbed baptisms and named such professors clinics and not Christians, a levity which Cyprian, Cyprian solemnly rebuked as implying their conversion in a fright. He says that it's a nickname which some have thought to fit to fix upon those who have thus been perfused upon their beds. So they didn't look at it as that wasn't common practice, and they didn't look at it as that was acceptable. The Novatians demanded pure churches, which enforced strict discipline, and so were called Puritans. They refused to receive the lapsed back in the churches, and because they held the Catholics corrupt in receiving them, they reimmersed all who came to them from the Catholics. <laughs> they were like, those people are corrupt. For this reason alone, they were called Anabaptists, although they denied that this was rebaptism, holding the first immersion null and void because it had been received from corrupt churches. Amen. Martyrs were held in such high honor at this time that this dignity was sought with a fur. Merit was ascribed to them in virtue of which they went so far as to give to other Christians papers in token of pardon sin, a practice which it was necessary to prohibit because it became so dangerous. Why? Prayers of the saints. They started having saints forgive their sins. That's, that's where that came from. The Novatius soon became a very powerful body spread through the empire, as Kurtz shows, and their churches flourished for centuries, exerting a purifying and healthy influence. Adam Clark states one grave charge against them was that they did not pay due reverence to the martyrs. So what does that mean? Well, here's what happened. If somebody, if, if one of those uh, traitors came in with a letter and said, I have a letter from one of the martyrs that says that you should forgive me. Well, the, Nova, no, the Novatius pastor would look at that letter and he'd be like, so? I mean, this, they're, they're just a man. I mean, so what did they not do? They didn't accept their persons. They didn't have respect of persons. So the Novatius churches were fighting that. You have to understand, things are peculiar. I want to try to help you with something that, that, that take with you. I know this is a longer lecture, but just bear with me here. This, there's, there's, a, there's something you have to remember. When you study history, you have to study the surroundings of what was going on. Because when you see a lack of emphasis on something in that century, chances are it's because they were fighting something else. That was they were fighting tooth and nail against something else, and that there was such an over uh, exertion being being uh, get, you know fighting that heresy that was a damnable heresy that they let some other things sometimes go. Isn't that how we are too sometimes? 
We'll fight one thing and not realize, oh, we do err in a few other areas that we need to get right. But see, that's what happens. So you have to understand when you don't see them fighting against certain things that hard right there, it's because they had their own battles to face. They were facing different circumstances. So their churches had different strengths. If you look at if you look at the churches in Revelation, look at those seven types of churches. See how they had different struggles, each one. Why? Because they had unique challenges, just like we do in our generation. Our generation, we're, we're not fighting the same things. We fight some of the same things, but not all of the same things the novation has fought. So, see, they're fighting against uh, respecting of persons and admitting somebody from a letter from a martyr that died to pull on their heartstrings to make them think, well, we respect that martyr because they died for the faith, so we'll go ahead and let you in. They were like, no, you get on your own merits, not on somebody else's, right? That's, that's the, the premise of that. That's what was going on. They did not pay due reverence. They were accused of not paying due reverence to the martyrs, nor allow that there was any virtue in their relics. So they didn't relic worship. They didn't, they didn't care. Oh, great. You got, so, you got Peter's big toe. That's great. Well, we're not going to do anything about it. We don't care. We don't care, right? We're not, that doesn't move us. That doesn't change us at all. See what I mean? They were very, they were very specific about those things that, that they did. They they held it. They stood against the apostasy. But Adam Clark says um, that uh, which he pronounces as decisively a mark of their good sense and genuine piety. He says they had good sense and genuine piety to do what they did, in keeping with their lives, which were general, simple, and holy. We have no reliable data on which to state their views on baptism of babes beyond the fact that as an infant had not become a general custom when they arose. There was no need to form a sect in opposition there. See, so they didn't fight infant baptism. Why? It wasn't a problem. It hadn't reared its ugly head up yet. It hadn't become institutionalized yet into apostasy. So th that apostasy hadn't institutionalized where it was a common thing. So why would they speak against it and why would they have to? They wouldn't. It wasn't there. Right? It's just like people say, well, why didn't Jesus preach hard against homosexuality? Well, he did in the whole Bible. But anyway, but why didn't he when he came? Because it wasn't a problem in Israel. I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't generally spoken of. When did Paul in Israel? Why? Well, that had been weeded out long before that. Right? They'd have killed them, banished them, got them out of there. So what was the difference? When the Apostle Paul went to the Gentiles, what did he have to do? Preach against homosexuality. Why? Because he's dealing with Romans now. He's dealing with Greeks now, and they're a bunch of perverts. But anyway, that's, that, that's, that, and they are. Nationally, they're a bunch of perverts. Historically, they're a bunch of perverts. Well, how, how do you mean? Well, go into a Roman Catholic church and see all the naked boys. See all the naked statues. Every, well, don't, but, but look at all the naked statues everywhere. Caesars had boys. Right. So did Greek philosophers had boys. So did Aleister Crowley. See, see, see what I mean? Why? Because they're, they're pagan. They worship false gods. So Paul preaches against those things. Paul, Paul preached, but Jesus didn't deal with that because he was to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That wasn't an issue. That wasn't their problem. Their problem was they were blinded by their own self-righteousness. Amen. They understood the law. Most of it. <laughs> not all the application of the law they did not understand. Jesus straightened them out in Matthew chapter 5. We have no reliable data. Okay, I read that already. Then these several facts indicate that they had no sympathy with the, new, with the few who began to favor this innovation, namely that novation, their founder, was an adult at the time of his illness and so-called baptism, that, it, that the difficulty of obtaining a pardon of sin after baptism made men defer it as long as possible in this age. And further, that we have no record of, the, of one martyr, confessor, writer, or member in any church being baptized as a babe for the first 250 years of Christianity. On the contrary, it is recorded that the two Clements, Justin, Athenagoras, 
Theophilus, Tertullian, Cyprian, and the nameless hosts were baptized after reaching full manhood and of their faith in Christ. When Novation was a presbyter at Rome, infant baptism had not found its way there. More than a century after this day, Boniface, the bishop of that church, is found addressing Augustine on the question, asking his counsel and expressing grave doubts on the subject. It is much as a child could not believe in Christ, and no, no one could warrant that he would believe thereafter. Socrates says that Novation was martyred A.D. 253 to 60. 260. All right. Yeah. That's the third question, Lee. <clears throat> Let me see if I haven't covered anything else here that might help as we finish up here. I mean, he says it a little different way here in J.T. Christian. He says, the rise of the Novation churches was another outcropping of the old strife between lax and strict discipline. In the year 250, Novation strenuously opposed the election of Cornelius. We talked about that. These churches continued to flourish in many parts of Christendom for six centuries. Dr. Robinson traces a continuation of them up to the Reformation and the rise of the Anabaptist movement. Great numbers followed his, Novation's example, says he, and all over the empire, Puritan churches were constituted and flourished through 200 succeeding years. Afterwards, when penal laws obliged them to lurk in corners and worship God in private, they were distinguished by a variety of names, and a succession of them continued till the Reformation. That's a long time. Amen. On account of the purity of their lives, they were called Catharii, that is, the pure. What is still more, says Moshim, they rebaptized such as came over. We talked about that. Um, oh, by the way, here we go. Let's, let's talk about this. Since they baptized those who came to them from other communions, they were called Anabaptists. The Fourth Lateran Council decreed that these rebaptizers should be punished by death. Accordingly, Albanus, a zealous minister, and others were punished with death. They were, says Robinson, Trinitarian Baptists. Amen. They held to the independence of the churches and reorganized or recognize, excuse me, the equality of all pastors in respect to dignity and authority. So they didn't, they didn't recognize Rome. Okay, we'll finish with uh, Cramp here. We'll finish up with him. He's got a little bit to say here that will take a little while. Uh, not too long. We'll read it quickly. And we'll skip over some of the parts that we may not need. Um, okay. Uh, the Novation, the Donatists, he puts together in this as two leading sects of the period now under consideration. Uh, they were many, there were many other sects so-called, for it was the fashion to designate a heretic. Listen, every individual who thought differently from the majority had to consider those who agreed with him as a consulting a party, usually bearing his name. If we were, if we were to do so now, the multiplication of sects would be indefinite. So you hear Baptists, you hear Ruckmanites, or you hear, you know, you hear different groups of people that, that have different names, right? Of, of people that they followed down through history. Uh, again, remember, all the Waldensians, were all the Waldensians Orthodox? No. Are all the Baptists today that are out there Orthodox? No, they're not. Are all the Baptists that come under the Baptist name the same? No, I can guarantee you they're not. You know as well as I do, being in this church and being in other Baptist churches, they're not alike, all of them. They have a similarity but they're not going to be all alike. They're going to they're going to have some stark differences, right? Okay, let's see. Uh, we read that already. We don't need to cover that. Novation p possessed with talent a zeal and that he became a popular teacher. On the death of Fabian, the bishop of Rome, in the year 250, there was a strong desire that Novation should succeed him, and he would have done so had it not been for his known sentiments on one point. Lax habit of discipline, as he believed, had grown up and were mischievous in their tendencies. In the D.C. and persecution, great numbers had apostatized who, on the return of tranquility, sought readmission of the churches. So Novation, he didn't get chosen pastor, and the reason he didn't is because of his discipline. They, they wanted to bring in all of those people that had left. So anyway, Novation said God might pardon them. They might find a place in heaven, but the church must not be defiled, for it is a congregation of saints. Now, whatever opinion we may from respecting Novation's particular theory, it is undeniable that the principle on which it rested was derived from the New Testament. Yet it was too spiritual for the times. 
a majority declared in favor of Cornelius, who was duly installed the Bishop of Rome. Nevertheless, the minority would not yield. The time had come, so they argued for a decided stand. The holiness of the church was in danger and must be maintained at all hazards. Separation was better than corruption. They withdrew, formed a separate church, and invited Novation to become their pastor. Other Others imitated their example in various parts of the empire, and Novation churches sprang up in great abundance. They continued in existence for more than three centuries, which we talked about. Uh, they became the difference in the Orthodox versus the Catholic body. Uh, carrying out their governing principles in all its details, they baptized all who joined them. We talked about that. They deemed other baptisms invalid. They, by the way, did you know that this church, that every church has a right to do that if they choose to? You can examine someone's baptism, and as you look at it as a church, as the men, as we, as we look over those things, we could say, well, you know what? We don't believe that's correct. We don't believe that's scriptural. That person would have a decision to make. Do I submit to a baptism here, or do I have a conscience? D does my conscience dictate that my baptism was real, and I go somewhere else? They have that right to do that, but we also have the right to hold to what we believe here. You see what I mean? We have a right to not accept what they, what they have, <clears throat> right? That's right. It's autonomy. They, they have the right to do that. There is no evidence at the time of no, the novation separation from the Roman church that infant baptism found its way to Italy. We talked about that. Uh, we talked about the, you know, the, uh, okay, when infants are baptized. Well, we already talked about that. We didn't worry about that. Novationism and infant baptism were diametrically opposed to each other. It was impossible to preserve the purity for which the novationists contended in any church which had admitted the novel institution. Those who had been baptized in infancy might evince when they reach maturity an utter destitution of vital godliness and consequent unfitness for union with a Christian body. But being already members by virtue of their baptism, they could not be expelled unless they fell into gross vice. And so their influence and example might operate most injuriously on the religious character of the church. This could not escape the observation of Novation Christians. It would prove a salutary caution. We may safely infer that they abstained from compliance with the innovation and that the Novation churches were that what are now called Baptist churches adhering to the apostolic and primitive practice. Had the writings of Novation authors been preserved, we should have had more explicit information, but it was the ancient policy to destroy all books written by alleged heretics. Novation published a work on the Trinity, which has now not been which has not been involved in the common destruction. A copy of it is now before the writer. It is generally commended for its clearness and orthodoxy, but there is no allusion to the baptismal controversy. So that's where we'll stop here. But Novation, he wrote a lot of books, and he wrote one on the Trinity, especially that has been it is popularized and, and well known. All right. So anyway. Lots, lots to think about about the Novatius, but one thing that you that that one thing that holds out with the Novatius very strongly is their church purity. They believed in a pure church. They held to it. It mattered to them. It ought to matter to us, Amen. Uh, because Jesus gave us instructions, right? He gave us order. He gave us discipline. He gave us ordinances. All right, we are going to take a break for about fifteen minutes, and then we are going to break up into prayer groups, and we are going to pray. Uh, we're going to have a time of prayer together, and um, so let's do that here right now. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for a wonderful history that we have, and, and thank you, Lord, that above all history and everything else, we have the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>